Behavioral Health Today, a podcast by Triad Behavioral Health, where we cover trending topics in behavioral and mental health. This podcast is designed to share unique and relevant topics occurring within the world, our communities, and bring them a mental health perspective. Hello and welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor, and with us today is Jerry Rodriguez Menendez. Jerry is the department chair of the MS Clinical Psychopharmacology Program at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. He's a licensed psychologist in Florida and a board certified psychologist with the American Board of Professional Psychology. He specializes in psychopharmacology, neuropsychology, and pediatric psychology. He previously held physician privileges with Memorial Regional Hospital and Joe DiMaggio's Children's Hospital in Hollywood, Florida, Level 1 Neurosurgical Trauma Center. Dr. Rodriguez is bilingual and has published research in both English and in Spanish. Dr. Rodriguez is the president of the American Academy of Clinical Psychology and joins us today as an expert in today's topic of psychopharmacology. Jerry, mi amigo, como esta? ¿Qué tal, Graham? Gusto en verlo. Nice to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so looking forward to our time. Jerry, as we approach this topic today of psychopharmacology, can you give us just as a start, kind of a background of psychotropic medications and mental health, how they typically been prescribed, and just a brief overview, please. Well, I believe that psychotropic medications have actually been prescribed for millennia. But in terms of today, what we're referring to are medications that are used to treat mental disorders. And so there has been a virtual explosion in pharmacotherapy over the last 50 years. Right. And today we're, we're looking at many mental disorders as being brain disorders and how we can help patients both through psychotherapy, but also through pharmacotherapy. Very good. To date, we know that psychiatrists, oftentimes some general practitioners have been prescribing. Is that pretty much the main practitioners that have been prescription folks at this point? Well, you know, it varies. Some studies would suggest 60%, others would suggest 70% of psychotropic medications are actually prescribed by primary care physicians. I've heard the same. And these physicians really do not have the the time, and many would say that they do not have the training Mm -hmm. to be treating mental disorders. And in terms of psychiatric practice, that's where we're seeing a, a real necessity and need for providing psychiatric services to patients, in particular pharmacotherapy. Yeah, so then we get, as we talk about this topic of psychopharmacology today, we talk about an opportunity for psychologists to be trained in psychotropic medication being able to bring their clinical experience, their ability for diagnostic uh, clarity into this realm of prescription privileges. How long have psychologists been experiencing training in this area? Well, this would surprise a lot of people, but psychologists have been prescribing in the United States for over 25 years. My understanding is that psychologists began prescribing with the Indian Health Service. Hmm. However, uh, most people use the demarcation of the Department of Defense project in 1991. That program was concluded around 1997 or so and produced 10 graduates. And psychologists since then have been prescribing psychotropic medications quite competently in the United States. And so there are now five states that have passed legislation in which psychologists can prescribe. What are those states, Jerry? That begins with New Mexico in 2002. Then in addition to that, we have Louisiana in 2004. Mm -hmm. Illinois joined the group in 2014. And most recently, Iowa in 2016 and Idaho in 2017. But a little known fact is that psychologists can also prescribe in the active duty military. They can't prescribe in the VA, but they can prescribe in the active duty military and they can prescribe with the Indian Health Service. So when you consider the totality of states, you're really looking at about 45 states or so 
in which psychologists can prescribe because you have military bases there and you also have in many states what are termed as Indian reservations. In your bio, as I was going over it and had a chance to present it today, you've been there and done that in so many areas. I've known you for about a decade now and uh, I've always been very impressed with all the layers of work that you've done, both with our medical colleagues and um, our mental health practitioner friends and colleagues. Why do you think there's a unique opportunity for psychologists to be prescribers of these psychotropic medications? What is, what is unique about psychologists coming in and being able to prescribe? I, I think, Graham, that it has to do with patient access, first and foremost. That is our chief concern always. And indisputably in the United States, there is a shortage of mental health professionals, particularly in terms of rendering psychiatric services. So much so that in the United States, in order to fill the psychiatric residencies, we have to bring in foreign graduates for many of those particular slots. To give you an idea, in 2017, According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, there were only about 25,000 psychiatrists in the nation to meet the mental health needs of over 300 million Americans. In addition to that, about 50% of psychiatrists do not accept insurance payments. So mm -hmm. they only go fee for service, which means that they're going to be providing services more to the affluent than patients who are really in need. To give you another idea, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 2018 estimated that approximately 114 million Americans reside in mental health shortage areas. Mm -hmm. Moreover, in 60% of all counties in the United States, 80% of all rural counties, there's no psychiatrist. Yeah. Not one psychiatrist in the particular area. So between about 40 to 50 percent of individuals needing mental health services never get into the system. They it's never have access. I've heard of patients waiting months in order to see a psychiatrist. I live in Hawaii and some of our rural islands, Molokai, Lanai, they really struggle with mental health services. Telehealth helps some but that's a couple of degrees removed from being able to really track somebody. And I can see why your stat earlier, around 60% of the psychotropic medications are being prescribed by your general practitioner or your internist. Do you think um, psychologists have any specifics in their training or in their professional shaping that allows them to be uniquely trained to be good prescribers? Oh, without doubt. I think that, first of all, psychologists are very effective in establishing a strong therapeutic relationship with patients. And where you have a good therapeutic relationship, you're going to also have trust. Yeah. And so psychologists have skills in terms of psychotherapy. We understand how to use psychotherapy if a patient is, let's say, more nonverbal as opposed to verbal. In addition to that, we're very well trained to do assessment in working with patients. So I see this aspect of uh, prescription authority just yes. being another tool that psychologists will utilize. It's not that it's going to become the only tool that psychologists will utilize. Yeah, really good. I know that there are certain training models and educational models to become a prescribing psychologist. Walk me through. I know there's one at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, and I know your involvement there. Fill us in. Basically, we're talking about training that meets designation criteria with APA for education and training in clinical psychopharmacology. So most of these programs are known as MSCP programs, meaning Master of Science in Clinical Psychopharmacology, or it might be a Master of Arts in Clinical Psychopharmacology. To give you an idea, these programs all are going to cover the core competencies in psychopharmacology, 
they will have slightly different curricula. At the Chicago School, our two-year program covers 15 courses. The way that we have structured this is that five courses are essentially basic science courses. And the first five courses that a student takes are general anatomy, because, you know, to psychologists, although we study the mind, the body can often be a black box to us. So general anatomy is of critical importance. And then they take as well at the same time pathophysiology. So when, let's say, a professor is covering the cardiovascular system and general anatomy, the professor in pathophysiology is covering disease states of the cardiovascular system. And we use that for the various systems in the body. The next two courses that students take are biochemistry and neurochemistry, and then they take neuroanatomy. And we pair these two courses together because there is a very fine relationship, intimate relationship between the central nervous system and mm -hmm. the peripheral nervous system. Mm -hmm. And the cast of characters in terms of being transmitter substances kind of remain the same. What changes are the receptor complexes. So it makes sense to link these two particular courses together. And then the fifth course, that's basic science, is pharmacology. So those first five courses provide students with the foundation knowledge that they'll need to reach higher levels of training. I affectionately refer to the first five courses as boot camp. <laughs> right. But, you know, our faculty who are immensely qualified, uh, about 50% of our faculty are board certified. And then we have a faculty member from pharmaceutical sciences. We have two faculty members who are physicians, one a board-certified pediatrician, the other one a board-certified emergency room physician. And then, of course, we have our psychology teaching faculty. So, you know, it, it's a, a great program in terms of mentorship. Now, once the student completes those five courses in basic sciences, there are three courses that are interspersed in the program in terms of clinical psychopharmacology. So you have general clinical psychopharmacology, then you have special populations, pediatric and geriatric psychopharmacology, and then students take a course in substance abuse and chronic pain management. Really so those are the three courses in clinical psychopharmacology. There are four courses that the student takes in terms of assessment. So we have an assessment sequence. Mm -hmm. Begins with physical assessment because some medications can cause movement disorders, for example. So it's very important that a psychologist be able to assess sensation and movement, but movement in particular. And so in physical assessment, you have to learn how to conduct a comprehensive physical examination minus the genitalia. Yeah. After a physical assessment, then the student will take clinical and procedural skills, which basically teaches them what to do with the patient from day one until discharge, how to document appropriately, how to write scripts appropriately, and certain complexities that can occur along the way, such as a woman becoming pregnant, for example. Then the third assessment course is diagnostic methods because students must learn how to order and interpret blood and urine testing. They have to also be able to order electrophysiological measures such as EKGs and EEGs, and then finally radiological examinations. So we're talking about CT scans, MRI, SPECT, just as uh, examples, and even, you know, simple x-rays. The fourth course is clinical medicine and patient evaluation, which is kind of the recap of the assessment sequence. And then finally, there are three special courses that the student takes. The first of these is ethics, which is pretty much a no-brainer. It's based on the APA code of conduct. The second is problem-based clinical learning, and that's where students get into a lot of problem-solving scenarios and how would they monitor and, and treat a, a patient appropriately. And then the last course is a clinical research project. 
that is not a dissertation or a dissertina, but just mainly a concept paper about an area of interest to the student. So that gives you kind of an overview as to how our program is organized. Now, I should also mention that that is only for the academic component because we also offer the clinical training component. In Illinois in particular, because we have a, a campus in Illinois and our program was very much aligned, not just with designation criteria, but also with the Illinois law. So for licensed psychologists, we allow them to go on clinical rotations. There are nine different rotations that a student needs to go through in order to become a licensed prescriber in Illinois. So they have to go through emergency medicine. They've got to go through surgery, internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, geriatrics. They naturally have to go through psychiatry, and then they do a rotation of their choice, an elective, which is typically either going to be in psychiatry or neurology. I wanted to ask, how long is that practical piece? And I'm curious, too, about the feedback that these trainees coming in, the feedback they receive from other medical personnel that are working with them alongside them, our own profession, what's the feedback? on the services that they're providing? Well, right now, we only have two students that are in the clinical training component. This is because of the fact that our program began in 2018, in spring of 2018. Got it. Nonetheless, we are now enrolling our eighth consecutive cohort of students. That's great. So there has been very high demand for this particular program. And we have entering sessions three times a year. So in January, in May, and in August, we enter uh, new cohorts of uh, students. So given that the program began two years ago, students are only now, graduates are only now getting into their clinical rotation sequence. However, I do happen to know that there are about 15 students going through clinical rotations in Illinois, Mm -hmm. and overwhelmingly, the response has been positive. Moreover, there's research, for example, Wendy Linda and Robert McGrath in 2017 looking at how medical professionals perceive prescribing psychologists, and again, overwhelmingly, the feedback has been very positive. I'm really glad to hear that. I would not be surprised, and I would imagine they would be great team members, very collaborative in a multidisciplinary team, and I would imagine their involvement and input would be uh, of much benefit, both to the staff and to the patients. You know, when I'm thinking about different training models and and the educational models that are going on, if, if you could magic wand, you know, and modify the training models for psychologists in APA accredited programs, what would you look to bring around? change possibly or add? Well, first of all, I would say that I really believe that APA doctoral training programs need to carefully examine the question, are we teaching our students a viable model for the 21st century? Mm. And I don't believe that most health service psychology programs, meaning clinical counseling, school psychology at the doctoral level, really understand that health service psychology is in a crisis situation. And I know that crisis sounds like a a very serious word, and most professionals would disagree with me. But I will tell you that just as an example, According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and this is also backed by APA research data, the average salary for a psychologist in the United States, for a mid-career psychologist, is about $85,000 annually. For a psychiatrist, Mm -hmm. it's and you can just go to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and check this out and just put annual psychologist salary or annual a uh, psychiatrist salary for psychiatrists it's about $220,000. Yeah. Now, 
consider that for a nurse practitioner who has a two-year graduate degree, the average annual salary is about $110,000. So very clearly, integrated health care really, you know, they, they reward practitioners who are prescribers more than non-prescribers. Mm -hmm. What's really worrisome about this as well is that the average annual salary of a registered nurse, we're talking a, a very you know, important professional in an integrated healthcare team, but a professional who does not have graduate training. So at most they have a four-year degree and the annual salary is depending upon what year you look at is between about $6,000, uh, $9,000 less than what a psychologist makes with a five-year postdoctoral or excuse me, five-year graduate degree mm -hmm. requiring typically one year of postdoctoral experience for licensure. Add to that the fact of tuition. And what's happened is that there has been an explosion with regards to student loan debt in the United States. Yeah. And so for, you know, just for example, Duran and her colleagues in 2016 did a study on postgraduate debt with health service psychology programs. And the mean anticipated debt load for PhD students was $105,000. For PsyD graduates, it was $173,000. Studies done by the American Medical Association show, and these are very robust studies with about 85 to 90% of graduates, indicate that the average student loan debt for a physician is $179,000. So psychologists are coming out with these very large student loan debts, and then they're being placed in a position that is not going to compensate them enough to make a real return on that investment. And what has happened in the last eight years is that enrollment in health service psychology programs nationally has gone down by about 12% in eight years. In PsyD programs, it's gone down 15%. So very clearly, we are having a problem attracting students to the field. And, you know, we can't ask for a person to have a huge student loan debt and not make a salary that is going to make sense to them down the road, because otherwise they'll have to put off having a family, purchasing a home. I mean, all sorts of complexities that can occur. So you're clearly seeing that health service psychology training programs clearly could benefit from the Master in Science Clinical Psychopharmacology education and training. Absolutely. The other thing is that our programs continue to be five-year programs in clinical psychology. And so then when you look, I've worked with a variety of APA accredited programs over 20 years of experience. And I will tell you that you could take out quite a bit of what is offered by, you know, these various programs with the Thousand Flowers model and the like, and you could really streamline the training so that in five years, no more than six years, a person could graduate with the competencies that they need in health service psychology, and also in psychopharmacology. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why we cannot do this. It's just a matter of will. Yeah, yeah. Part of what we do in our training programs is we help develop and shape the identity of these folks coming into psychology. And the issue of identity of psychologists is often raised, you know, when there's discussion of a pre-doctoral training in clinical psychopharmacology. What do you see the identity being for young psychology trainees coming in that are incorporating or even thinking about incorporating the psychopharmacology component into their training and their identity formation? Graham, that's a great question. And a major shift that occurred with uh, designation criteria, which, by the way, has to be 
was approved by the Council of Representatives with APA is that they're now allowing students to do a substantive amount of training in psychopharmacology at the pre-doctoral level, meaning while they are doing their doctoral studies. And in July of last year, we had six doctoral students graduate from our program. Moreover, when we compare the performance of doctoral students versus licensed psychologists and licensed eligible psychologists, the doctoral students actually perform better in our program. And so then the average GPA for a doctoral student is about a 3.6 for the psychologists, licensed eligible psychologists are doing great but the GPA, average GPA, has been about a 3.3. Moreover, the doctoral students have done better in terms of aggregate course GPAs. They've done better in 13 out of 15 courses. That's terrific. So, you know, I really think that, that this is a type of training that can be integrated at the doctoral level. And our students overwhelmingly tell us that it's just making them better psychologists. They haven't lost any identity as a clinical psychologist. It's been the opposite. Their identity as a clinical psychologist has been reinforced. Really good. Kind of dovetailing off of that and maybe winding down with this, give a message to those upcoming clinicians in our field that are considering a master's of science and clinical psychopharmacology, what would you want them to know and to consider about incorporating this into their training in a way that could be enhancing? Well, I think that at any particular stage, and, and we have even senior psychologists enrolling in mm -hmm. the MSCP program, but especially early career psychologists, I think that this is really a golden opportunity to get the training that you need to, number one, be able to impact these issues of patient access that we've been discussing and to provide a, a better continuum of care for our patients. But then number two, it opens up many avenues professionally for the individual. Personally, I, I think that irrespective of whether one ever prescribes or not, mm -hmm. that the training will make a clinical psychologist or a HSP psychologist a more well-rounded psychologist. You'll be able to speak, I believe, more effectively with other professionals in the medical field because you'll understand a common language that they are utilizing and you'll, you'll better understand what are the key aspects of patient functioning that they are really looking at. That's an encouraging message. Jerry, for those that are interested, whether it's those uh, considering this field or those that are early career practitioners or even those of us that have been practicing for a while, if they are interested in any more resources, learning more about this, programs that offer this, where would you direct them to go? Well, I think that Division 55 would be a great website for them to go to with, with APA. That's the division for pharmacotherapy. Now, I would also state that it's very important that an individual look at the various programs that are out there and then make a determination as to what is going to be the best model and the best fit for their own use, because the models do differ a little bit in terms of their curriculum and in terms of their requirements. Very good. Thank you. Jerry, it's been great to be with you today. Thank you for joining us on Behavioral Health Today, giving us your expertise and experience and involvement with psychopharmacology. Thank you, Graham. It's been a real pleasure to be here and to discuss this important topic with you. And again, if there are any listeners that want more information, I'm always just a click or phone call away. Fantastic. Thank you again. Folks, thanks for listening. And we look forward to seeing you next time on Behavioral Health Today. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Triad Behavioral Health Network, all rights reserved.